that are remaining, uh, we're going to turn our, in our Bibles to Acts chapter 26. This is the last sermon uh, in our series on revolutionary living. And uh, we are super excited about, I believe, all the great things that uh, have come out, will come out of this series on revolutionary living. Uh, and if you know that since the month of May, or June, we've been uh, engaging in this series together, and uh, my hope and my prayer is that we have all heard some things that will benefit us and give us some wonderful uh, tools moving forward uh, to live our lives according to the ways of Christ. Now, one of the great gifts of doing a series is that uh, series always come to an end, and uh, and hopefully at the end of the series, it gives all of us an opportunity to do a little bit of reflecting on what we've heard, some broad things, and then think a little bit about what does it mean then for us to actually apply what we've heard. Uh, we know that in our lives, all of us uh, have opportunities uh, on a regular basis, uh, certainly, um, to make decisions and make choices. And how many of you know some decisions and some choices are more significant than others, or at least they feel a little more weighty than others? Uh, you wake up every day and uh, you make a decision to take a bath, praise God. Or you uh, make a decision to brush your teeth. And these are decisions, choices you make every day. Somebody say amen. amen. And, 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 and they're important decisions, um, but they're certainly not life changing decisions. Uh, some of us wake up every day and we decide uh, to get our kids dressed and send them off to school. We daily decisions. They're important decisions, but they are not these kind of once in a lifetime decisions. Some of us uh, get up every day and we decide to go to work. Important decisions. Amen. And you know, one may argue that if you wake up and don't go to work enough, it will be a life-changing decision. Uh, but certainly still, the fact remains that that is a daily decision. How many of you know there are some decisions that uh, crop up or rise up that are a little more heavy than just the decision you make every day? I, you know, can recall a few weighty decisions I've had to make in my lifetime. One of them was uh, when I was trying to think of which school I was going to go to for grad school. And I had all of these different options and choices. You know, schools on the East Coast, schools on the West Coast, schools in the Atlanta area. And I was trying to figure out, should I go to Duke or should I go to uh, Embry or ITC or should I go to Howard or should I go to Fuller or down in LA or should I just stay here in the Bay Area? And I had all these decisions and, 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 and I had to come down to one decision where I would be all in and just not, you know, because I couldn't go to all the schools at the same time. So I put all my chips on Duke, praise God. I went to Duke and I made a decision that I think uh, has impacted my life a little more profoundly than just the daily decision. Or uh, another decision is, uh, you know, who I would wear. Praise God. And, you know, it wasn't like I had a whole lot of choices. It wasn't like, you know, you know was choosing between Jill and Susie and Cherise. Praise God. It was just really one. Amen. And she had a lot of choices. Praise God. And I'm glad she chose me. Somebody say amen. Yeah. The decision, amen, that, that, that's not necessarily a daily decision, but a decision that I made that actually changed the course yeah. of my life. And I want to submit to you that what this series has really been about is trying to uncover those moments of decision that we make particularly as it relates to following Jesus. Because how many of you know following Jesus is not a decision necessarily that is as kind of you know, uh, 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 routine, if you will, or or or, or has you know a, a, a nominal amount of weight as like you brushing your teeth and taking a shower every day. But how many know when you make a decision to follow Jesus, that should change the course of your life? Yes. And here we find in this series, I hope, uh, a, a wonderful kind of uh, uh, plethora of examples of men and women who make decisions. 
to follow Christ. And they made these decisions against the backdrop of uh, persecution. They made these decisions against the backdrop of their own kind of well-being. They made these decisions uh, really not knowing what the end was going to look like. But they believed. And they had a certain kind of assurance based on their experience with Christ. And the testimony they heard and the signs and wonders that they witnessed that um, I have to make a decision about who and how I will live the rest of my life. These disciples in the book of Acts, they uh, very clearly were just ordinary people like you and me. They were uh, not of nobility. They weren't of these kind of uh, high, you know, pedigree type folk. Uh, and they, they were just regular folk, fishermen and, 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 and tax collectors and, 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 and potter and, and uh, working with their hands and, 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 and just regular folk. And, and, and they had an encounter with Jesus and that encounter to grips with some important decisions. Some of those encounters look like Jesus walking by and seeing them fishing and he said, follow me and I'll make you fishers of people. And one guy had to look at the fish that was pulling, coming out of the water that was making him a living every day and then make a decision about what Jesus is offering. I mean, that was a profound decision. Some of them uh, were hanging out with their family and Jesus told them, leave your family and come and follow me. Now, you know, for us today, we that don't like our family, that's not a big kind of command. Somebody say amen. Amen. But back then, family was all you had. You, you leave your family, you ain't got like nowhere else to go. Some of us got options, praise God. They didn't have to watch them back then. It was like, you leave your family, that means you left your job. Uh, your, you know, your family's business, you, you left your village, you're just out there by yourself. You want to follow this itinerant rabbi, this wandering rabbi who just hangs out on mountains and talks to people? <laughs> mm, that was a decision. But then they see Jesus die, and then they're all left here trying to figure out, man, we left everything to come and follow Jesus, and now he's dead on the cross? I not made the wrong decision. How many ever felt like that? It's like, you know, you, you do the right thing and then you sit there like, man, look at all these folk ain't even making good decisions. They seem to be thriving. Here I am trying to love folk. Man, trying to be honest. Trying not to treat folk badly. And I always come out on the short end of the stick. You ever felt like that? Yeah, I know. I know we would never say it out loud to God, you know, we don't want to like tell God off, but we just think it. As if God can't read your thoughts. <laughs> so you have all these disciples there, hope for dash, and they ended up seeing Jesus on the cross. Then three days later, Jesus starts knocking at the door saying, hey guys, I'm back. They're like, wow. Jesus, you kind of went above beyond what I expected. And that decision again to follow Christ Change the course of their life, and the book of Acts is the record of that decision. Now, we see at the beginning of the book that many of them were still scared of cats, hiding out in rooms and all whatnot. And, 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 and Jesus told them, the angel told them, go to Jerusalem and wait till you get some power. And then the Pentecost experience happened. They all got filled with the power of God. And then they went throughout the whole Roman Empire. The Bible says in the book of Acts, when we've been reading, you may remember this verse.
that are often weighty. And I want to submit that as we wrap this series to a close, part of what remains in front of us is still this question about are we all in? Because make no mistake about it, uh, it is not a given that we are all in to the ways of Christ. How many of you know there's some parts in our lives that are going to need continuous conversion for the rest of our lives? Amen. Amen. So for some of us, it is not about every single part of your life more than it is about your whole life. Being all in, open to the ways in which God will change and transform us. That's why I am not one of these preachers that uh, wants to focus on slices of our lives as if they operate individually from the whole. It's like easy focus on the parts of your life or my life that some of us don't struggle with. I don't struggle with addiction, so I can like really make addiction like the crown, like achievement, you know. Of the evidence of following Jesus. But then that gets me off the hook. <laughs> Praise God. All my free body addiction. Somebody say, man, that's, you know, we just know some of us are, you know. I'm, I'm allergic to peanut butter. Uh, so when I talk about calling a fast for peanut butter, how many know that's not a sacrifice? Amen. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> yeah. yeah. But don't you know that when you take the whole of the gospel and the ways of Christ, there's never a part of your life. That is always in line with every single way of Jesus. So what does that mean? That doesn't mean that we all just get to live in your kind of way, free from accountability and transformation. But it means we all must live together, holding each other accountable in relationships and discipleship, and being open to the transformation that God will bring in our life through the course of us walking with God. And I find it. There are some moments where we must, though, make decisions about who we are, who we will be, how we will be. That if you don't come to a place of decision and transform and transformation where you say that I'm going to be all in, how many of you know you can end up just being... I said earlier today, like the hokey pokey. Yeah, you know, your right foot in and your right foot out. Your right foot in and you're shaking it all. And it's like, how you know, uh, nobody wants to really be in a relationship with hokey pokey. <laughs> I wish I had a church in there. Yeah. Yeah. Nobody wants to be in a relationship with someone who's like, you love me today and tomorrow you hate me. And then the next day you kind of like me until you get a better option. Like, who would be in a relationship with that? <laughs> My dad told me, he said, son, you can do bad by yourself. <laughs> you don't need two people. How I many of you don't need two folks to have your heart broke, praise God? Right? Yeah. So I'm going to be having a heart break. I just, you know, go until I find someone who can take good care of my heart. If you never high five and tell them, take good care of me, man. Don't take advantage of me, but take good care of me. <laughs> so, so today's sermon is, is simply this. How can you and I be all in? Everybody say all in. All in. All in on the revolutionary way of living after Christ. How can you and I make sure that our lives are all in? That we are not the holy pope of Christians. We are not the hokey pokey Christ followers. But we are all in. Don't you know that all in does not mean perfect? That's not what all in means. All in is really about you being open to whatever God says. And truth be told, we are mostly only open to what we like. <laughs> now you know this why you know you get a lot of you know places where you know people like hear like you know all these reaffirming messages all the time and that's what the folks want to hear. You know, folks want to hear that if I give you twenty dollars, then a hundred dollars gonna be in my mailbox right. by the end of this week. Right. Woo, thank you, Jesus. Sign me up for that deal, because that's no great deal. <laughs> If I just, you know, say a couple of prayers and drink a couple of, you know, holy water, glass of holy water and anoint myself, then healing is coming to my house. Yeah. Folks want to hear that, so folks will pack big auditoriums to hear what they want to hear. But when you got to hear things like you cannot grow if you stay the same. Right. <laughs> wow. Wow. Uh, pro uh, uh, punishment in prisons. What? He was in what? You know, 
that you cannot follow the, 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 the Prince of Peace and be so dependent on your peace. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Your pistol and your gun and your weapon. You know, folks don't want to hear those messages. That's why we start talking about that, folks. You know, you, know, you can't be following Jesus and be sleeping around with whoever you want to sleep around with. Okay. You know? You know what I want to hear. But how many of you know growth don't happen by you just having an echo chamber of what you want to hear? Come on, man. Sometimes you got to be challenged, make a decision. Are you in? Or are you out? And that's the text we're dealing with today. The Apostle Paul, he is uh, one of these folks who, if you look at the book of Acts, a wonderful example of how God can take what everybody else thinks is outside the realm of redemption. And God can take you and turn you into somebody in the eyes of God. Paul started out at the beginning of the book of Acts, if you remember, as a hired hitman. Going around killing Christians. The government would tell him, go kill these folks, and Paul be like, gladly. Paul go out, boom, come back. Who's next? And Paul, this guy, Paul was so, 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 so tough that the Jews, like, oh, here come Paul, hide your women and children, because he ain't playing. <laughs> but God gives a hold of Paul. God turns Paul from a killer into a proclaimer, a church planter. And it just goes to show you that you or me can never be defined by the worst thing we've ever done in our lives. <laughs> Yeah. 
truth is, the jury's still out on some of us. Somebody say amen, right? Yeah. I'm both accurate and sane in what I'm saying. And the king, Paul now appeals to the king. The king knows what I'm talking about. And I'm sure that nothing of what I said sounds crazy to him. For he's known all about it for a long time. Because the king and all of us know this was not done behind the scenes. You don't answer that because I know you believe. But King Agrippa did answer it. And he said, keep this up much longer and you'll make a Christian out of me. <laughs> Some versions said, Paul, you almost persuaded me to become a Christian. But Paul, still in chains, said, that's what I'm praying for. Whether now or later, not only you, but everyone listening today, become like me, except, of course, with these chains. Now, let's go through a few things that I think are so critical for us to be all in. Here in the story, you see the first thing that Paul demonstrates that I think must be indicative for us is we must all first know what we believe. Tell your neighbor, know your stuff. Tell them that, know your stuff. Know your stuff. Now, what is it you should know? Paul was aware of the work of God, not just in the abstract, but in the course of what God was doing in Paul's life. I don't know if any of you have ever had this experience like I recently had 
where, you know, I, I was, you know, uh, eating my food and I wanted to put some ketchup on the food and, and, and you know, so I go to the refrigerator and, and there's a bottle of ketchup in the refrigerator. That's one of these new sophisticated plastic bottles that's painted red. So, of course you would think that if there's a bottle with the word ketchup in the refrigerator, that there's something in it. Reasonable assumption. <laughs>
right. We worried about what our friends gonna think. <laughs> what our boo gonna think. And I'm just here to tell you, if you're not with someone in a relationship that can really affirm and reaffirm your walk with God, don't you marry that person. Yeah. You'll yeah. find out later that that was the wrong one. Right. Mm. I don't know, that's something free for you now. <laughs> Your 
life. When we're praying over the other, you ought to not take it for granted that this prayer I say right now could change my life. When you're hearing the word of God and you're feeling the spirit tugging at your heart, you ought to say, I'm going to be all in today. I'm not going to be the hokey pokey Christian because how many know the worst thing is to have your right foot out when God is all in? Mm. My prayer is that we're not a grip of almost I've been persuaded. But I pray we're like Paul. Where we're always all in. Paul attracted folk wherever he went because people were attracted by his conviction. And it didn't mean that Paul was perfect. Paul was not a perfect guy. If folks got a psycho uh, analysis on Paul just off some of his writings, and they said that Paul had a small man's complex. They said he was real short. I don't know how they figured some of this stuff out, but they said he had real scrawny legs and a big wart on his head. They said he, he, he was not the most attractive guy. I don't know how to get all this stuff. I don't know if there's a picture that I have not yet seen. But the fact still remains is that perfection is not what it means. It's about continuing to be open to the ways of God. You attract and convince secrets. Agrippa said, in this short amount of time, you've almost persuaded me. My challenge and my question to us, revolutionaries, who are we attracting? And who are we convincing? And the final thing, final evidence of you and I being all in are chains don't matter. Paul, standing in front of the king, in chains! Standing in front of the king in chains, and he is still able to give a convincing demonstration and argument about the work of God. And I don't know what your chains are. Some of our chains may be abuse. Some of our chains may be doubt and anxiety. Some of our chains may be people. Some of our chains may be really bad experiences. Some of our chains may be continuing to be let down. Some of our chains may be dishonesty. Our chains may be all kinds of challenges we may have, but I want you to always know that when you're all in, even when you're in chains, I mean, you're not going nowhere. My story is not changing because things get hard. Because I'm all in. And I'm all in because I have an experience that even when I was at the top, God took good care of me. Amen. Amen. Even in chance, 
he's still all in. Yeah. Yeah. And this is what my prayer is for us as a church. My prayer is for you as a follower of Jesus. Be all in. Put all your chips on God. Don't wait. Don't put 50% of your chips on God and then 50% of your chips on yourself. I guarantee you, you're going to lose 50% of that time. Huh? And uh, I mean, no, God don't lose. So you bet on yourself, you love. Losing proposition. Be all in on the ways of God. And let us be these folk when people see us coming. They describe us as coming to turn the world upside down. Stand with me one as we get the prayer.